Um, I'm a native of Grand Forks, North Dakota. Theodore Roosevelt, of course, spent um, a very important time in his life in Dakota. And so he's always been with me as an inspirational figure. And I found myself um, both looking into the future of nonfiction and in the past and how it relates to the future with Theodore Roosevelt. That is how this new and strange adventure uh, began for me. Hi and welcome to our Meet in the Middle virtual series. We're excited today to have Ed O'Keefe with us. Ed has a very impressive background that we will have him share here in a bit, but we're also anxious to hear about his current passion and the work that he is doing right here in the heartland, honoring Theodore Roosevelt with a library in North Dakota. Ed, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you being with us. Well, thank you, Angie. It's a pleasure to be with you. So like I said, as we get started, tell us about your impressive background and then um, share with us sort of your passion around the work that you're doing in North Dakota, um, specifically highlighting Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, well, thank you, Angie. It's a pleasure to be with you and with Heartland. I um, am so admiring of the work that you are doing. I know you just got going in 2019 and it's amazing what you've already accomplished. Uh, so my background was actually 20 years in media and I um, left my media career in 2018 and was teaching um, a, in a faculty position at Harvard University um, I was, I sort of joked that I had one foot in the present. I was writing a research paper on the, the future of nonfiction in the streaming era. So what Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, um, all of these different new services were going to do with news and nonfiction documentaries. And then I had one foot um, in the 19th century where I was researching a book on Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I'm a native of Grand Forks, North Dakota. Theodore Roosevelt, of course, spent um, a very important time in his life in Dakota. And so he's always been with me as an inspirational figure. And I found myself um, both looking into the future of nonfiction and in the past and how it relates to the future with Theodore Roosevelt. And I was very fortunate to be introduced to a, a fellow North Dakotan who was at, um, at the Kennedy School at Harvard. <laughs> And he said, wait, let me get this straight. You're a North Dakotan who is thinking about a new career path and you're writing a book on Theodore Roosevelt. I need you to meet Governor Doug Burgum, um, who is the governor of North Dakota and who was championing a $50 million endowment from the state of North Dakota uh, if, if $100 million in private philanthropy was raised for the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library. And that is how this new and strange adventure uh, began for me. Well, it sounds like the perfect Heartland story and how connections and relationships definitely are made. I love what you said about, you know, there's a lot of talk about how do we learn from the past to then influence the future. So tell us, Theodore Roosevelt died in 1919. Why build a little library to honor him now? That's a great question, Angie, and one that we certainly um, certainly need to address to have relevance for now. I think Theodore Roosevelt is one of those fascinating figures. Um, think of the time in which he lived. Right? There, was, there was economic stress and change in the nation. There was a tension between the rural and urban areas. They were moving from an agrarian to an industrial society. It was a rapidly advancing technology, right? When Theodore Roosevelt was born in 1858, there was no electricity, there was no automobile. He would be the first president to be in a submarine and, and in an airplane. So the amount of change in his life technologically, the amount of change in the economy, there was an immigration wave that was really changing the composition of the country. And all of these things sound achingly and eerily familiar. We like to say that History doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And you could take some of the paragraphs out of Theodore Roosevelt's time. And if you didn't know that they were written sometime between 1898 and 
1919, you could swear that they were written in 2021. Um, yeah, and, and also, here's somebody who was a avid and ardent conservationist before there was really a word for it. I mean, he used his power to set aside 240 million acres of land. We have these public lands that are all of ours to treasure. And in large part, we do because there was a president named Theodore Roosevelt that recognized that if we don't set them aside, if we don't conserve the land, if we don't think about the delicate balance between humans and nature, it could all be gone. And so partly what we are doing at the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library is inverting the idea of a presidential library. We're, we're not building this library to write the first draft of history for TR's legacy. We want it to be the people's library. We want people to come and experience and learn from not just about TR. I feel a kinship with Heartland because this is about economic opportunity and diversification of the economy in the Midwest and in particular in North Dakota. It's about changing the perception of North Dakota uh, and also the, the TR triangle and the entrance to this great American West. But it's also about a platform of ideas, a common ground where we can bring people together and we could take those lessons far, far, far beyond the TR library itself. You said it and you share the mission. Heartland Forward is about changing the narrative about the middle of the country and kickstarting economic growth. We want to continue to be a resource for communities and highlight the great things that are happening in the heartland. So with that said, quality of life, arts and culture, you can talk about economic improvement, but those things are so very important. And we see that when we're talking to leaders across the region. So tell us about Medora, North Dakota, population 200. Why did you select that specific location and what will people experience when they get there? That's a great question, Angie. Um, so first of all, Medora, North Dakota is symbolically significant because it is the home of what is now referred to as the cradle of conservation. Theodore Roosevelt came to the West first in 1883 to hunt a bison. Um, after that trip, and actually during that trip, he made a $14,000 investment, which today would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he did it because he, he envisioned a life in the West as well as the East. Shortly after that trip, his wife and his mother tragically died on the same day in the same house, February 14th, 1884, Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. His wife had died only two days after giving birth to their only daughter, Alice. Theodore Roosevelt was distraught. He was completely destroyed by this horrible turn of events in his life. And he returned to Medora, where he had bought a ranch just the previous September. And he lived in Dakota for the better part of two years while he mourned the loss of not just his wife and his mother, but also his beloved father who had passed away at age 46, just six years earlier. So here's somebody who's 25 years old. He has essentially quit his job as an assemblyman in New York. He doesn't know what he's gonna do with his future and his life. Should he be a writer? Should he be a scientist? Should he return to politics? And he comes to the great American West. He comes to Medora and he, he, he sees the balance of species and human. He sees the industrialization of America as he comes from New York all the way out to the edge of the great Northern Pacific Railroad in Medora. Right? He understands what he will later call the strenuous life and the resilience to go on. And, and in some ways that story seems like a fantastical one where he ends up president of the United States and the hero of the Rough Riders and this mythical figure. But in, in, a, in a way, it's a very human story of healing. So it's a very special kind of interesting place. You, you can look out and see 65 million years of geologic history in the Badlands, and you have this connection to the cradle of conservation. So while the population of the town itself is not large, there's 700,000 visitors every year to Theodore Roosevelt National Park. 
it's uh, about 125 to 175,000 visitors to the Medora musical between Memorial Day and Labor Day. We know there's an audience there, but more important than the audience is the specialness of this place and diversifying people's experience in the West to come feel and experience a little bit of what TR found in that healing and special place of nature. You've definitely convinced me and you're right. I mean, all of it translates to sort of that personal connection, telling that story. And we're seeing that in the heartland. A lot of people are moving from the coast back to their hometowns. And, and I, I'm from Oklahoma, so I understand sort of the importance and the people that make a, a small town great. And, and there's so many great things that you just shared about why Medora. You mentioned earlier the governor and the engagement, and I like to say, and my team has heard me say uh, many a times, the magic happens with projects like this when you really bring the right people around the table. And, and we talk a lot about public-private partnerships, but, but tell, us, tell us the uniqueness of this public-private partnership um, of getting the library started. Well, it's um, been, I think, a model and a prototype, hopefully, of a public-private partnership on the state and private philanthropic level. First, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to Rob and Melanie Walton, who are the founding benefactors of the project. They stepped in at a time when the future of this project was completely uncertain, and I would say maybe even a risky proposition. They came to um, uh, the governor and the Waltons had a conversation about trying to get the state, the Roosevelt family and private phil philanthropy all having a stake in the future of this enterprise. And they, they really came up with a unique model. The governor said, I will go work with the legislature to pass a $50 million endowment contingent on $100 million in private philanthropic uh, commitments. That's obviously a big goal. Um, and we need to ensure that the Roosevelt family wants to make this happen and that North Dakotans are invested, not just from the state level, but in that additional um, fundraising. So the, we were very fortunate to have the Waltons um, put up uh, $50 million as the founding benefactors, which gave us $50 million to go. And I am very enormously proud to say that the entirety of that remaining amount was raised with those with North Dakota roots. And that's where we found the magic here is that people came together with a vision and an ambition of a project that would not only diversify their economy in Western North Dakota and create a new identity for the state but it would also really invest in the history of this place. The private and public commitment of having an endowment really drive the fundraising and vice versa was the, the key to our success. That's great. And I think, you know, while, while you said the community and the state really got involved, now they can be proud of what they have, the story that they're telling and really share it with people from around the world. And these are projects, while this is a large project in Medora, North Dakota, there's examples all across the heartland of, of how you can do this, whatever size of a public-private partnership that you're looking towards. And, and we, we are looking forward to providing those additional resources for communities at Heartland Forward of how you can do this to tell your story in your community and use the assets that you have. What advice would Theodore Roosevelt give us um, as we look into the future and grow our economies across the heartland? Well, I think Theodore Roosevelt would say, do what you can with what you have where you are. Um, that is a famous quote of his in addition to, you know, keep your, um, keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. I mean, he was both an ambitious visionary and a practical realist. He saw his life in both the East and the West. And, and what I mean by that is he, he recognized the value of urban life and his roots in New York, but he was completed by his experiences in the West, in nature, in open space. He had an appreciation of both places. And I think that there's something that Heartland Forward can really add to this conversation and dialogue about bringing people together 
as Americans for civic dialogue and conversation. It's, it's really hard to dislike someone that you're in conversation with and listening to. So I, I hope Heartland Forward um, will do what they can with what they have, where they are, invest in these very valuable communities in the heartland, try to bring people together to listen to one another and do a bit of what we are hoping to achieve with the TR library, which is to look for leaders in these communities to think about the citizenship and active in the arena involvement of every person that, that we can possibly touch and get involved in this project and to think about conservation and our connection to nature. You know, there's nothing more valuable than the open space and place that we have to, to all enjoy and connect with one another. So I wish you all the best and all the success in the world. And if we can be a part of your mission, um, we would love to, to do so. Well, thanks so much. Great advice. I love meet people where they are and we, we can learn a lot and look forward to experiencing the great things that you're building. And, and thanks for your leadership and passion in this project. We'll provide more details about how someone can plan their visit and look forward to being in touch. Thanks so much, Ed. Thank you, Angie. Good to be with you.